Mark Daniel Nelson here today with Make My Music. We have a interesting two-part series here that we're going to put out on two separate days. First being today, which I, if my calculations are correct, is a Tuesday. And the second part will be Thursday, two days later. So if you're catching this after that, it doesn't matter if you watch part one or part two first. In 2018, I was contacted by my good friend, Brian Carr, who's a composer in Los Angeles, about doing a film with the director that he worked with a lot on a bunch of films in Ukraine. Now, Brian Carr is one of those composers that just writes unbelievably good melody. So the film is called Ya Tai Vin Vona, and in America it's pronounced Me You He She. Now, this film was Volodymyr Zelensky's final film before he became president of Ukraine. And at the time, he was considered like a Tom Hanks of actors over there. He was a comedian that did a lot of great movies. And this film specifically was a romantic comedy about him and his wife that were married for a while, that were about ready to get a divorce, and they got lost in this giant, crazy adventure. And at the end, you guessed it, they stayed together. It's a really great film. Even just watching it with subtitles, I actually really, really enjoyed it because it was really well written. And the director, David Dotson, who I worked with on a documentary and a couple other features, did a really good job of delivering that, even if you don't understand the culture over there. In general, it did really well. I believe it was the largest grossing film in Ukraine cinema. I'm not going to get into the war that's happening right now currently, except for that we are making these videos, part one and part two, because we want to do something for relief for Ukraine. And we set up specifically a donation center with UNICEF to put some kind of help there. If that means a dollar, if that means $20, I'm not gonna hold you to the fire. But please, if you can give something. And as an incentive, we're going to offer a large, full multi-track of one of the larger cues on this film. So you can actually open it up at home, mix it yourself, listen to things, and kind of just understand how filmmaking is happening other places in the world. But right now, let's dive into this track and go over the mix I did on it back in 2018. First thing you see, if you're not into filmmaking or know anything about the actual score side of filmmaking, I will make it short, but I will talk a tiny bit about it. You'll see that things like the title says 5M8. Now, usually that means it's the fifth reel, it's music, and it's the eighth part of the fifth reel. So when you talk about cues, and I call them songs because... It drives the composers nuts when we're recording or mixing them. I'll say, what song is this? And they'll say, it's a cue. And I say, but it's still a song. Brian Carr is really thorough at pulling out a specific vibe when he's writing a movie. And traditionally, he goes towards either creative sounds that he brings out of either synths or sounds that he'll create from scratch, ground up, only to be as custom and unique as he can. And with that, when it's coming down to a romantic comedy, you want to start pulling the heartstrings a bit about what you're trying to achieve, which is obviously emotion and familiar melancholy feelings and happiness and sadness and all these things that go with love. This piece specifically is neat because there is a part in the center that needs to be really intimate like a quartet versus a very large orchestra. So it goes in where it goes a big orchestra, which we tracked in Budapest, pulled down to a smaller orchestra slash quartet in a small room done at Igloo in Los Angeles. And that's a really cool studio because it has a really live sounding small room. And you want to get this kind of intimate sounding feel versus it being in this cavernous large space. So pay attention to those things. And then it goes and blooms right back into the really, really large, lush, Hollywood, romantic era score. And it works really cool together. So I'm going to talk about what I do usually in the process. 
why I do specific writing things for automation and just going through the track. And then follow us again on part two to understand a little more background of everything, to listen to the multi-tracks again, download the multi-tracks, and again, please donate to Unison. Let's take a listen. fun with this and break out the instruments. Let's go to bar nine and just take a listen to just the Budapest strings. For this pass, it's relatively simple. It's relatively clean. But there is another pass underneath that that is doing a little more of the melodic side. So let's listen to that. Same place. And combined. Let's listen to just the Igloo Quartet. Now there's a solo violin in this. Here's the solo violin. Now if I open up what I'm using, I have two interesting things that are helping tame the harshness of it. Now, I believe they used a 67 on the actual solo. But in general, it still felt a little, not harsh, but just a little edgy for me. So if I take out the UA610 and then the EQ of the Fab Filter, which is doing some taming of the top end and some taming of 725, it sounds like this. You can obviously hear the click track, but that doesn't really play into the whole thing when everything is open. You can't really hear it, so we just go with it. There's no point of spending time trying to get it out if you're not gonna hear it on top of everything else. I just wanna focus on why I'm using the 610 for a second. Now the 610 in, it does this really neat thing that when you're using it correctly without pushing it too hard, it softens a little bit of the edge and it puts things back a little bit as well. So it's not necessarily pulling proximity away from it, but it's just softening things a little bit. And then combining that with the fab filter on the top end, it really balances out nice.
Now combine with the quartet. I don't really have much going on on separate instruments for the quartet. I can solo them out and you can hear them on your own. And then the room. See how it's a smaller room and it creates a little different environment, pulls you into the scene a little bit more. Brian has a really unique thing where he likes to use two types of pianos usually when they're doing the theme or the melodic side of it. There's a high register thing that is a real upright and then there's this really velvety low end kind of fat chordy thing going on that is probably either keyscape or a different, he'll have to fill you in on the part two about what it is because it really does sound good. And he'll talk about why he does that to kind of give you an idea why he mixes the two sounds. On my bus, I don't really have any EQ. Sounds really good, clean, but I do have some parallel compression that has EQ and compression in it. Now, if you take it out, it's this. If I put in the parallel on the piano, Here's out. What I'm hearing is everything's relatively saying the same, pretty wise. It's not pumping on the top openness of it. It's pumping on the low stuff and pulling that in. And that's kind of what I wanted out of this piano track, where I wanted the lower stuff to kind of come up. I like the sound of compression but I don't like the sound of it being clamped down. So I choose the parallel to get a little of the tack out of it with the EQ and a little bit of the compression that brings up all the noise. But other than that, that's really all I use on the piano for this track. It doesn't seem to need anything else other than maybe a tiny bit of the Vienna Hall reverb. As you can see, in score music, less is usually more when it's mixing a ton of stuff together. The more stuff you start adding, compression, EQ and stuff, it just starts sounding painful. That's probably the best word I can explain. Painful. It's aggressive. It's not, it's distracting you from what you're trying to actually achieve when you're mixing something like this, which is creating some kind of movement. Now, obviously, if you're doing trailer music or suspenseful or any kind of piece that's trying to create kind of tension, you would use that. But for this stuff, this romantic comedy stuff, it doesn't need a ton. A lot of it's the way the players are playing. A lot of it's the vibe. And all we're supposed to do is just try to help it together. Now you can see a little bit of the balancing of the orchestra, but usually it comes in pretty well balanced. You just have to add that extra 10% which is what we're doing. Now, if you listen to the harp here, I do remember the one thing that bothered me if I take off all the plugins. And then in the track. You kind of lose it. So I thought, okay, how do I keep it there without it stepping on everything else that's coming in, the accordions, the pianos, the strings. There's some bells and stuff like that, all the percussive stuff that's pretty. And I said, well, I don't want to bring it out too much, but I want to add a little bit of an attack. So what I did was, again, brought up a little bit of the top end, took a little bit of the honkiness out, just with a multi-band compressor, and then brought in Mr. Spiffy, which adds a tiny bit of the snappiness. Now, if I just hit the delta on this, we'll hear what it's actually doing. And 
in. Out. In the track. See how it's not necessarily compressed, but it's adding a little bit of a flick. But it's staying in its right place inside the mix. So another subtle thing that you want to do to just add a tiny bit of flavor without adding a ton of muscle and color like compression or some kind of aggressive EQ that will poke. You can do this kind of almost tickly thrusty thing that I like on the spiffy plugin. It's definitely one of my favorite plugins this year because what it can do is pull out all these elements that can kind of make things sound a little more real and kind of just playing around with it with the Delta where you can find your spot and then balance it in. It's really killer. The Tycho bass needed some help on the bottom octave. Sometimes you're fighting with the low end once everything escalates to the peak dynamic of the cue. And you just need a little bit more synthesized kind of low end to just poke out to really take it home for the final explosion. And parallel compression with distortion can help that. But using something like a low air, which is almost synthesized low end underneath, really does help it as well. So I have that on the track itself. And then I also have a parallel on the drum bus. And now in. It's not like R bass, it's not like EQ. It's a very specific sound. It's almost a sustaining synth drum, if that makes any sense. It does a really good job when you're mixing it in and sometimes you have to fool around with the aligning to help it kind of sit right with phase. But when you need that extra thrust at the very end, at the peak of the track, this does the trick really, really good with drums. Before I let you guys go, I want to go over a little bit of the automation focus on this cue, specifically because it is more about the, the vibe. I do a lot of automation fixes with clip gain on the tracks itself. And for the movement and the emotional connection side, I jump down to the buses and then I automate those banks specifically for the feel and the breathing side of it. Now, if you can see here, it's kind of looking like it's not doing a terrible amount, but when you combine all of them together, there's a lot of movement happening. There's a lot of parallel things going in and out. And when I mean parallel, I don't mean like parallel EQ or parallel compression. I mean like parallel movement of specific groups of instruments that are kind of, just think of it as like waves and stuff. to show you one last thing and I'm going to pull in and out the Fairchild and just so you can hear what I'm doing and why it's adding just that extra little sauce. It's pretty subtle. Maybe listen to it one or two times, but when you kind of get it and hear it, it's going to make you smile. 
it has this kind of velvety, buttery kind of sound that does something really special with this analog AT101 that is a little different than the unfair child. It's a little different than an original fair child. And it works really, really good on strings and stuff. Putting it in line versus taking it out. Let's start with it out. Now again, remember there is no compression. Threshold is all the way off. So all we're doing is using it as a line amp color box. wraps it up for me today. Don't forget to watch Thursday for part two. And please, please go to unicef.com and learn more about what you can do to help Ukraine relief. Thank you for watching.